Hi everyone, I'm Katie from Hackster. Welcome to the Introducing SWAN webinar with Lose Wireless. We've got Brandon Satrum, Zach Fields, and Rob Lauer here with us today to introduce the SWAN and show you how easy it is to use with Arduino, CircuitPython, and C++, and how it can be integrated into IoT products using the Blues Wireless note card. Uh, so Brandon is the VP of Developer Experience at Blues Wireless. He has over 20 years of experience as a technology professional and has worked extensively as both a software and hardware engineer across a variety of platforms, technology stacks, and industries. Uh, Rob is the developer relations lead at Blues Wireless and has a passion for machine learning, the Internet of Things, and the open web. And then Zach is a senior developer experience engineer at Blues Wireless. He has a long history in the Internet of Things, starting in Windows IoT and then moving to Azure IoT, Particle, and now Blues Wireless. So a big thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. Uh, the first part of today's webinar will include a presentation and some demos. And then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end for a live Q&A. So if you do have questions during the webinar, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So if you can just type your questions in there, Brandon, Rob, and Zach will answer as many questions as possible before the end of today's webinar. So uh, one additional added bonus as part of this webinar, Blues Wireless is giving away a Blues Wireless dev kit to two webinar participants. So anyone who attends this event live with us today will get their name in the drawing to win and winners will receive an email later next week with more information on how to claim that prize. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and I'm gonna let Brandon take it from here. Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. And thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, we're gonna talk about SWAN and Blues Wireless, which uh, if you have not heard of us before, it should be a, a fun time. But before I go any further, um, I did want to mention that if you end up having the drop or you have any technical difficulties or connection issues, uh, the Hackster folks are going to be recording this webinar and it will be uh, posted to their channels and it'll be provided in a link to an email. And then we will actually tag that webinar in our uh, YouTube channel as well. So you can go to bit.ly slash blues dash YouTube to visit our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't yet, please do visit that channel and subscribe. Uh, we post a variety of content pretty much on a weekly basis from webinar and event recordings like this to project videos from the things we release on hackster.io, as well as a newish series of ours, Blues Wireless TV, uh, where our very own, uh, one of the members of our team, Gabe Sanchez interviews, members of the Blues team, customers, and leaders in the world of IoT, which by the way, if that's you, if you're building something cool, and you want to be on Blues Wireless TV, uh, definitely shoot one of us an email. So we have a lot of great demos to share today, and it's all really featuring the star of our show, The Swan. I'm going to start and spend a few minutes and talk about who Blues Wireless is, what we do, why we exist. Uh, but we're really going to spend most of our time today not only talking about The Swan, but having a demo party. That we'll actually walk through using The Swan with Arduino, using it with CircuitPython, and then using it beyond the feather. And of course, we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please do use the Q&A feature in the Zoom uh, webinar chat. Uh, if you, we prefer you use the Q&A feature and not the chat, we'll try to keep an eye on both. But really the best thing to do is to use that Q&A feature so at the end we can go through those questions and actually uh, address anything that comes up as we go along through the way. And also, please stick around for the webinar today. So those that attended and were here do have an opportunity to win one of our dev kits, either the uh, Note Carrier AF, which includes this one. It's a Feather form factor version of our uh, core development board, or the Note Carrier Pi, which can be used with a Raspberry Pi. So introductions. Um, I did want to introduce myself and my colleagues who are going to be joining me uh, on this webinar here today. Um, my name is Brandon Satram, and I'm the Vice President of Developer Experience at Blues Wireless. Uh, I have been in the IoT industry for a long, long time, a professional technologist for over 22 years, and have been at Blues Wireless for the last year and a half. Uh, I love the work that we do and having an opportunity to speak to audiences like this about the things that we're working on. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Rob Lauer, who's the head of our developer relations team, and Zachary Fields, or Zach. Uh, who is a senior developer experience engineer. And the three of us are going to walk through all the demos and share all the fun of SWAN with you. And hopefully by the end, uh, you'll want to participate and get one of your own and join us uh, on this journey. So 
<clears throat> let's get started by talking about blues and talking about why we exist. And I'll spend a few moments on this. But I want to start with this concept of prototype purgatory. This is that dreaded part of product development between a great idea and deploying a product to the field or a pilot to the field. Often the reason why this part of any product development effort seems to last so maddeningly long is because building an IoT product requires a mix of skills and capabilities, some of which many of us are comfortable with and some that, we're, some that we aren't, right? Many of us that come into this space, we might be web developers by trade and we understand the, the web and cloud side of things, but hardware is very complex and difficult for us to grok. We love playing with it, but we always know that there's so much complexity there that we may not have as much experience in. And on the other side, you might be an embedded engineer. You might have spent most of your career in the hardware world, but you never thought about connectivity or you didn't really have an opportunity to work with it. And so the other side of that story, the sending data to the cloud and then building an application or a you know, web app or a mobile app or some set of serverless functions in a cloud service, those are things that might be foreign to you. You don't have as much experience really, really knowing how to build that piece of the application. And every IoT application, because of the very nature of connectivity, spans that entire breadth of technologies, right? The reason we add connectivity to sensors is because we want to do something on the other end. We want to see a chart or a gauge or a widget or have some remote control capability. And so there's a lot. And if I could sum up the current state of the IoT world in one word, it would be complexity. Uh, and complexity comes up so much. It's such a common refrain in this world. And every time that I think about that word complexity, I think about a quote from our CEO, the CEO of Blues Wireless, Ray Ozzie. And it's something that he said a long, long time ago, long before starting Blues a few startups ago. But it is really just as relevant to us today uh, as it was in the software world when he said it. And that quote is, complexity kills. Uh, it sucks the life out of developers. It makes products difficult to plan, build, and test. Uh, my guess is that even if you haven't heard that quote before, it resonates with you when you hear it, when you think like how much your day to day, even if it's purely in the software side, like we know many of us as technologists know what that actually feels like. Um, and so when I think about complexity, I like to classify it in the world of wireless IoT and connectivity, because there's a whole lot on the hardware side and on the cloud side, but a lot of the complexity sits between your sensors and between your cloud applications and how you actually tie the two together. And the way that I like to refer to that is the strings of wireless IoT, right? These are the landmines or potholes in IoT development. These are the things that developers that we cannot control and which make our lives difficult. The things that slow us down, cut off choice, or provide unnecessary duplication of effort. And there's a whole lot of these things to be fair, but I really like to classify what I see as the most common strings of wireless IoT in four buckets. Difficult to program modems, too narrow or too wide guardrails, pitfalls with device lifecycle management, and then security as an afterthought. So if you've ever had to program a connectivity module with cryptic AT commands and pull out your old Hayes manual from 1983, you've experienced the strings of wireless IoT. Same if you've ever been told that you had to adopt your IoT vendor's entire ecosystem down to the microcontroller, programming language, API constraints, and IDE just to get your project online. Or if you put off activating that cellular IoT device that you bought because you just wanted to wait until you were really ready because you didn't want to start the meter on a monthly data plan that you don't have that you, that you don't want that you would have to pay for whether you use the product or not. Or if you were forced to embed keys and certificates in your firmware in order to get your sensors to send data into the cloud applications that you prefer to use, right? Some, one, maybe all of these things might feel familiar to many of you. I know that they definitely do to me. And at Blues Wireless, we know the strings of wireless IoT well because we've lived them in our own projects. We have worked with them and experienced them all before. And it's why we created the core products that make up our business, the note card and notehub.io. And our goal really was to cut those strings of wireless IoT and create a product and experience that's simple to start, that's really available for any developer to use with any set of sensors, any host, and to connect very securely and quickly into any cloud application and the cloud applications that they prefer. And it's something that works with one device, but it can scale up as your products go from one to many devices as well. And it starts with a note card. 
The Note card is a low power cellular and GPS module with cellular IoT connectivity in over 135 countries. The device comes with 10 years and 500 megs of data baked into the cost of the device itself. There's no monthly data plans, no activation fees. The price is on the tin, as they say, so you don't have to worry about that ticking clock when you start your project. Uh, I build a lot of prototype projects and demos and examples with Blue's technology, and I like to say that you can prototype without fear uh, using the note card because it's all bundled in the cost of the device that you get. And instead of spending time learning a labyrinth of AT commands that are unique to every modem manufacturer uh, and cell connectivity provider, you can use JSON with the note card to do everything from configuring the device, understanding its location, to adding sensor data, and more. Really, everything that you can do with a note card is expressed through that JSON API uh, that you can use to speak to it from any programming language all the way down to an 8-bit Arduino. If you can send strings on your to your microcontroller, if your microcontroller can send strings, it can talk to the note card as long as it has a serial or I2C uh, bus on it. So um, with a note card, you can actually go from unboxing to sending any data you wish to the cloud within minutes via a secure cellular connection. Every note card includes the keys it needs for making a secure connection to our cloud services baked into the device at the point of manufacture. So there's no error prone key rotation or, or cloud provisioning process. You power the note card up, and you start sending it data and it knows where to go to phone home. Uh, and if you have used a note card before, you've experienced this, but if you haven't, we actually provide a web-based uh, a web-based onboarding experience where you can actually connect to your note card over the browser, uh, a serial connected note card over the browser and, under, and start using those JSON commands to assign it to a project on our cloud side to start sending it sensor data and more. Like I said, it knows where to go in order to phone home immediately. And where the note card phones home is the notehub.io cloud service, which is ready and waiting for your project data once you bring your devices online. Notehub.io is designed to be a thin middleware layer between the note card and your cloud applications. So we make it really easy to route data out to your cloud application provider of choice, whether it's a cloud platform like AWS, Azure, GCP, or a visualization service like UbiDots, Datacake, or a platform like Losamp. And once that data has landed in your cloud, it's ready for you to build the visualizations, to manage physical assets, and to make critical business decisions faster. And this is the fun part, right? For many of us, the reason why we're doing this is because we need some set of insight or intelligence on the other side. And the whole point, the whole reason that Blues exists and we built the note card and the products around it is that you can focus on the solution that you're looking to build, not how you actually build it. So with the note card and the note hub together, it can save you weeks of development time getting your devices and your cloud speaking the same language so that you can focus on building an actual solution like measuring water quality around your water treatment facilities, measuring air quality at schools and public spaces, or monitoring physical assets regardless of where they are located. And these images are actually from Hackster projects that we have released over the last year that really show a lot of different examples of how we've used the note card in our own projects and how our customers are starting to do so as well. So if you're interested after my little uh, sales pitch and framing of sort of who we are and what we do, if you have not yet tried the note card and you're interested in trying, you can grab it at shop.blues.io uh, and at SparkFun and soon will be available at DigiKey as well. So now with that out of the way, let's talk about the newest product in the Blues Wireless family, uh, the Swan. Now, this is a product that we announced uh, as a part of the Edge Impulse Imagine conference a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really excited to share with you today. Uh, it is not a waterfowl. It is a microcontroller. Uh, this is a device that we have been working on for the course of really the past year, and it was built basically out of some customer feedback and as a result of a direct customer interaction that we had with a customer that was building their first note card-based application. And this is a large industrial uh, refrigeration company and what they were looking at was creating a application that uh, monitored the fridges that they have deployed at customer facilities and they were using the note card but they needed a microcontroller that really was quite complex something that they could use to control lots of gpios lots of buses be low power but have a high clock speed lots of ram and flash and so we decided to actually build a board 
based on that customer experience of building, helping them design something custom, but a board that uses the exact same microcontroller that we have on the note card itself, because it is a low power, uh, high performance device. And so that SWAN, the core MCU on the SWAN is an ultra low power ARM Cortex M4 that's clocked at 120 megahertz. Uh, it's an STM32 L4R5. It's the exact same MCU that we use on, uh, on the note card on our cellular module. Uh, and it comes with two megs of flash and 640K of RAM. It's an absolute beast. And um, it runs around eight uh, micro amps and, and stop two mode. Um, and it's also when it's running, it can actually do a ton for you. Uh, it's an amazing uh, device that we have worked hard to have support from day one in C and C++, in Circuit Python, and Arduino. Uh, you can visit bit.ly slash swan dash MCU to learn more about the specs uh, of the device. But really, it is much like everything else we do. We built the note card with this idea that any programming, any embedded language can speak to it. We wanted to provide as much choice here as well. And one of my favorite things about it, it's also an MCU that's really built with machine learning in mind in many ways. That 120 megahertz clock is, is amazing for snappy inferencing on device and with two megs of RAM and 640K of flash is great for managing those large, tiny ML module models that we might get from time to time if you're doing complex things. And then plenty, plenty of pins for complex peripherals. I'm gonna come back to that uh, in just a few moments, but I do wanna dig into the Edge ML side because the Swan actually does have day one support for Edge Impulse. So I know that um, we're all big fans of Edge Impulse. I know that for many of you that spend time on Hackster, you're probably Edge Impulse fans as well. Love the product and the community that they have created. So we worked with them to make sure that we had day one support for Swan. So there's a full Edge Impulse guide at bit.ly slash swan dash guide. Um, that is in their docs as well as a guide that we've created for using Edge Impulse with the Swan. But I do want to talk about the language uh, language support for a few moments and actually get into our first demos. Because uh, that's the things that you're actually here for. I've talked long enough. It's time to let my much more capable colleagues show you uh, how these products actually work. And we're going to start today with using the Swan with Arduino. And uh, my colleague and compatriot, Zach Fields, a uh, senior developer experience engineer at Blues, is going to show you exactly how we can use the Swan with Arduino, VS Code, and a little bit of on-device debugging. So take it away, Zach. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Brandon. And I'm Zach, and I love the Arduino. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Arduino or not, but it has become the ubiquitous platform for turning your laundry machine into an e-bike or your vegetables into flamethrowers or your banana into a piano like it, it seems like the options are limitless and the community surrounding arduino is enormous and that's why it is particularly awesome that this one supports the arduino ide and development environment so without further ado let's arduino so I'm going to boot up the Arduino IDE. This is standard. We're all familiar with it. It's a clunky IDE. It doesn't really have a lot of debugging capability or, or any debugging capability other than printf. And uh, it's got, I would say, limited options. But it's a great place to start. So if we look here, I've got Blink set up. And this is the hello world of electronics. We're just gonna turn the onboard light on and off and on and off. So normally what you do is you select a sketch like Blink and then you come over here to tools and you would choose your board from the list. So if we look here, we'd be looking for STM32 boards, but we can see that's not an option in our list. Well, that's because we need to go into the file preferences and come down to this little additional board manager URLs and add in the STM32 Duino's board manager URL. So this is the same thing that you would do for ESP32 or any, um, what'd you say, any set of boards or architecture that isn't native to Arduino. All right, so we'll hit okay. 
and then now we can come up to tools and go back to the boards manager and we we're not in the list but we can add it in so now we can come over here and we can look for blues and you see this STM32 MCU based host was it based boards and that looks suspiciously correct and it is correct so we're going to go ahead and install that now this part does take just a second so like i really hated to do this in the demo but you don't get uh, what would you say i don't feel like you get the real idea of how simple this is if we don't go through all the steps because the rest of the steps take about as long as this install right here i i can't emphasize how simple arduino is and how easy and approachable it makes electronics and, and that's why we wanted it to be part of the swan that are that we this is one of the first things we did I guess was to get in the family here with the Arduino uh, environment so that we could make swan approachable and for anybody so we'll give it just a second here while it wraps up this install oh there it went great so close that and now if I come to over here again I'll look at the boards and now I see the STM 32 boards group. All right. So that's our, that's where we're looking. And in here, we're going to look around and we see blues wireless boards. Okay. That's us. So we selected that the menu went away, but it doesn't really end there. So if you come down and you, we got a whole new set of STM 32 options. Uh, notably you want the, UART support because this is what allows you to see kind of your printf debugging messages so always just enable that unless you don't need it and you know that you don't need it because it's great to get started if you just want to print to test a sensor or really anything like that uh, what else do we have here um, just smallest so it, it compiles a program down to the smallest for the optimization no debug symbols this is all fine. I think we'll move forward with that. And port, we need to find the board. Uh, I've got it plugged into USB already. Let me flash over and show you what it looks like. So if we flip over here. All right, this is the Swan and it's in its feather format. I've got it mounted so that you can see it a little easier right up under the camera. This little guy over here is a ST-Link V3 Mini and it allows us to program the board and more importantly, debug it. This isn't strictly necessary. You can connect to it directly with USB and program it that way and check, again, the printf or the console messages as sort of a printf style debug if you just want to get started in the easiest and fastest way possible. I'll need this for later in the demo, so that's why I chose to set it up with the ST link. All right, so let's come back over here. So I've got that all plugged into here. So I've chosen that and now I will upload the board or I'll upload this program, the default blink over to the board and we will see if it works. So let's come over here. And what we expect to see is that this is going to successfully install the blink sketch on the board and we will see the onboard LED start blinking on and off and on and off. Okay, so it looks like I've got a different console showing me the messages, but we've had a hiccup over here. And you see, if I get out of the way, that we had like a little error reported here. This is no problem. It happens on occasion. It typically revolves around um, power supply when it's being programmed. And I have it running on a, a LiPo for the sake of this um, demonstration. So it's on a not average uh what would you say power supply and so that kind of can cause it to be a little bit squirrely but let's flip back over and take a look all right as we can see it's blinking now and there you go that's how quick you can get going from zero uh with the swan and that's using the arduino id but since that's so fast let's start talking about things that are more interesting so instead of just the arduino id Let's go ahead and drop this out and bring up something cool like, I don't know, VS Code. That's way better. 
So this actually piggybacks on top of the Arduino ID. So you need to have that set up and prepared. But once that's ready, you can come over here to the extensions and look for Arduino. You'll notice that Arduino is an official Microsoft uh, extension. So that's great. So you know that's going to be a higher quality and then it'll be getting updates continuously. So we'll install this. And then I know that I just claimed that it had high quality, which is funny because this one actually has a problem. Let's see, I need to, how do I do this? I have to, I have to downgrade it to 0 0.44 because there's actually a bug in 0 0.46. So let's see, oh, install another version. Here we go. So let's drop back and install this version instead and then kind of reload the page. Let's see, once it gets there, there you go. So we reload it. All right, so now, like I said, we've got the Arduino IDE extension installed into VS Code, and let's see what it looks like to go from here. So, uh, and, the re and, and so why bother? Maybe that's a great question. The main reason, you can debug here, and I'm gonna show you that really fast. All right, so here we go. Uh, from here, we can press F1, and we go to the Arduino examples, and let's pick out Blink. It's in the basics, and there we go. All right, so now we have Blink set up, and let's maximize that, and uh, okay, so select the board type. Here we go. So now we'll look in here and we'll type Blues. There we go, Blues Wireless. Uh, the extension takes just a second, but it will populate that secondary list that gives you uh, the debugging, uh, well, like, was it the compiler optimizations and things like that. Uh, we'll let it kind of think and do its work, and we'll get this set up in all the other things we need to do really quick. Oh, there they go. Okay, so the swan, that's our only board, so that's going to populate straight away. We are going to use single wire debugging. This is what goes through the ST link. Your other option would be DFU, and if that's if you wanted to program it directly using USB. I don't, like I said, I'm gonna show you guys debugging, which is what's so cool about VS Code. And then, uh, let's see, we don't care about that. Let's give ourselves no optimization so that the debugging can actually step through the code without skipping things. And we'll go to the debugging symbols. We'll enable those, so we're able to look at them one by one by one. All right, so now the board is configured, so that's good. And then the next thing to do is to configure the debugger. So this is actually really simple. So if you come over here to the little debug pane, you can see where it says create a launch JSON file. Uh, another bug is you won't get this option. Uh, so if we click this, you can, you'll get that option, but you won't see Arduino in the list if you have a .ino file pulled up, as in if the blink file was open. So let me just show you that. So that's what we want to select, but before I do that, let's come over here, let's open blink ino, and now let's try that again. So we see this, create a JSON file. Oh no, it's not there. Ah, it took me forever to figure out this bug. Uh, I've reported it, and I'm sure that it'll be addressed in one of the newer versions. Uh, okay. So let's, let's open anything besides that. So a good one to do is, again, this configuration panel is just fine. So now if we click this, we see Arduino reappears in list. We'll click that. Uh, and then let's get the uh, terminal out of my way here. All right, so it pretty much set up all we need in the launch JSON, except it doesn't know where you have OpenOCD installed and I have pre-installed that to kind of keep this demo rolling, but we do need to identify it. So let me grab the path to that. So I'll do that and then I'll also choose which family of board that this is with. So what you see is like, this is OpenOCD is installed, uh, not all the way at the root, but very close. Uh, and then I have, sorry, the ST link interface that I'll be using. And the target file is the STM32L4, which is the family of boards that runs on the SWAN. All right, so that's the only change we need to make. We'll save that.
let's come back over to blink and let's set a breakpoint here. So we'll just keep it on because it's easier to see on than off. So, all right, so now we'll launch the debugger. Oops, I clicked the wrong thing. We'll launch the debugger and let me get this out of the way. So it, it will recompile and then it stores it off in its own little place. It doesn't use the pre-built binary. I think that's actually another bug. That's relatively no, new. You'll notice that the version is zero dot anything. So they're kind of like not really claiming it yet, but it is Microsoft's extension, not just some junky extension. All right, so you can see we broke, it stopped. So now if we go to my bench, we should see that the light's on. So let's have a look. And indeed it is. Let me see if I can get picture in picture here. I gotta get out of here and there you go. All right, so here's my breakpoint. So now let me go ahead and put another breakpoint over here. And then I'm gonna hit F5 and let it roll over and the light goes out. And then I can, I will step with F10 through the delay and the light comes back on and then I'll step again. That was the delay is expired. And then I'll step and the light goes out. So there you go, guys. That is step debugging with the Arduino IDE in VS Code on the Swan. This device is incredible and it lets you tap into the enormous Arduino community. So hopefully you found that fun. Uh, and from here, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Rob. He's going to be showing you how to uh, tackle your problems in a completely different way using circuit Python on the swan. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Hi, everyone. My name is Rob Lauer and I'm developer relations lead here at Blues Wireless. And I have the pleasure of walking you through some quick steps on getting started with using circuit Python on the swan proving once and for all that snakes and birds can actually be friends. Uh, but right away, I wanted to address this question, why CircuitPython? We've had some really active forum talk about why we went with CircuitPython versus, say, MicroPython, for example. And I'm not here to say one is better than the other, but I do want to point out that CircuitPython has a very low barrier to entry. If you think MicroPython is easy to use, CircuitPython really takes that next step. And it's all just Python at the end of the day, So, which, frankly, doesn't get much easier anyway. Next is a, a really vast array of tooling support. I'll show you the editor I use in a bit, but if you're using, say, Mu or VS Code or Sublime Text, you're basically covered anyway. Uh, one thing that is really attractive to me for CircuitPython is the extensive set of libraries available for all sorts of peripherals. And of course, the core is lovingly backed by Adafruit. And frankly, you know, we aren't necessarily limiting ourselves to CircuitPython on the Swan. No promises today, of course, but we are starting to look at the potential for MicroPython support as well. Now that I've already blown a couple of minutes of my time, what are we going to be talking about? Well, as promised, I'll show you how quickly you can install CircuitPython on the Swan. We will take a brief look at this mysterious CircuitPy drive that will show up post-installation. And we'll talk about a little bit about some IDE options and requirements. And of course, do a little programming magic on the Swan. All right, let's start with the installation. Now, until we get our quick start updated, you can visit circuitpython.org to find a little more info on using the Swan with CircuitPython. You can also grab the very latest CircuitPython binaries here if you really want to live on the edge. What's probably better for now, though, is to head to our GitHub page at github slash blues slash circuitpython. You can find all of the beta releases of CircuitPython using CircuitPython with the Swan here. Uh, in particular, on this page, you'll find the files you need along with some basic instructions, which we're going to do right now to set up our swan. Now, step zero is going to be to download the CircuitPython UF2 and swan bootloader files. With those downloaded, we can head to our swan over here. Make sure, of course, it's plugged into your computer via the micro USB port. And we can put our swan into boot mode by holding down the boot button on the left and then pressing and releasing the reset button on the right. Now we can head over our, to our terminal here and use the DFU util, utility to flash our swan, which takes all of a few seconds. Now with that done, we will see the swan boot drive appear on our desktop. So now we need to install CircuitPython. 
Now to do that, we literally just drag and drop that CircuitPython UF2 file onto Swan Boot. So let's do that here. And here is our CircuitPython UF2 file. Drag and drop it onto Swan Boot. The drive will reset and appear as CircuitPy in a matter of seconds. It's down here. Now let's take a look at the CircuitPython drive because it's kind of interesting. Now the CircuitPython drive is where your code and the libraries are going to live. You can edit your code directly on this drive and when you save it will just run automatically. You'll notice by default we have a code.py file and an empty lib folder. So CircuitPython looks for files in the order of code.txt, code.py, main.txt, and main.py to execute that automatically when the board resets. So the cool thing about CircuitPython to me is if you make a change to any code, the board is going to reset. Now the beauty here is that I don't have to put my spawn into bootloader mode, you know, recompile and reflash for every iteration of code that I might have to do otherwise. So it makes for a really grand developer experience. Now I mentioned you have a variety of different IDE or editor options when working with CircuitPython. Adafruit recommends using Mu, which is a really nice and basic editor. Problem is basically, uh, I don't think it's compatible with M1 Max, so I can't show it off, but I've had a lot of luck using Visual Studio Code and the CircuitPython extension here. Uh, I think it's a really nice implementation. Uh, but frankly, you know, for this demo, I thought I'd stick with the Tani IDE. You know, it's a really great specialized environment for Python, MicroPython, and CircuitPython as well. Um, so let's go ahead and connect to our CircuitPython drive. And we can see we have access to the CircuitPython file system right here. So I can open up my code.python file. I can look in that lib directory. You'll notice in the bottom right here, we have access to choose different interpreters. So of course we want to stick with running the interpreter off of uh, this, this one. So the CircuitPython interpreter here. And we have the uh, access to the shell or the, the Python REPL here that's running on CircuitPython um, within the Thani IDE as well. So if we execute, you know, this print hello world command, what's it going to do? Well, it's going to print hello world. But what's cool is then I can bring up uh, other commands, like I could say help modules to bring up a list of available modules that are avail available to me out of the box with this CircuitPython distribution. So, of course, we're, you know, we're using CircuitPython. We're, we have access to all the traditional uh, Python code constructs. So I can uh, print out a range of numbers here from 1 to 10. And no microcontroller demo is complete until, of course, we do what? Well, we got to blink an LED. So what we're going to do is we're going to import some libraries here. We're going to reference the onboard LED that is right underneath the micro USB port here. And we're going to blink it, right? We're going to turn it on. We're going to sleep for a half second and turn it off. So prepare to be amazed. OK, so it's running, you know, blink, blink, blink. Awesome. Now, I want to take this a next step and kind of link the swan to the rest of the Blues Wireless ecosystem, and that's to make it work with the uh, note card, so our cellular note card. To do that, it's going to be pretty simple. So I'm going to disconnect the swan here, remove it from my breadboard, and I'm going to add the swan to our note carrier AF, which is designed for Feather compatible microcontrollers like the swan, and plug you back in. All right, now let me reconnect here. And I think I need to quit and restart Thani. There we go. So here's our code again. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna copy and paste a bunch of code in here, but we're gonna walk through it. It's gonna be super simple. Again, we're importing a bunch of libraries. I'll note that we're importing the note card library, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. And we are referencing a product UID. This applies to a uh, project in NoteHub that again, I will show off in a second. And we're gonna access the note card over I2C, which is very simple to do. We're gonna send our first request to the note card using our JSON-based API. So that is this, we're sending a request and it's hub.set. And all that it's doing, it's saying, hey, attach this note card to that project in NoteHub and use this mode, which is going to be continuous or maintain a continuous cellular connection with the note card. And then we have a very simple while loop here. It's just going to go on forever. And it's going to say what? It's going to say, grab the temperature from the note card. So we have an onboard temperature sensor, which we gather with the card.temp request. And we're going to print some stuff out to the shell here. 
And we're also going to add a new note. So this is going to be uh, adding a note, uh, creating an event that's going to be sent up to NoteHub with just the temperature. So we're grabbing the temperature and sending it up to NoteHub. Pretty simple. And you know what? I'm missing a line of code. It's like, hey, we don't want this to run nonstop. We're going to do a time.sleep of 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, it's going to run this. Oh, except they had an error. Well, wait, Rob, you never installed the note card uh, library. Well, geez, I bet that's really tough. Um, let's see. Well, it's actually not too bad. So I've got my note card library that I downloaded from GitHub. And let's open up that CircuitPython drive again. Head to our lib directory. Oh, boy, this is tough. Oh, okay, that's it. Let's run that again. Oh, hey, now it's running. So we can see that our um, configurations were set here. And we've got the temperature from the note card being read, and it's being added to these note files, which are now going to be sent over cellular uh, to NoteHub. Now I'm going to let this run to gather a couple different notes here. And you see the temperature isn't changing. Uh, I could probably, I don't know, cover this up for a while and get it to, to raise a little bit, but uh, let's just let it create one more note. And then we'll head over to NoteHub and see this in action. Now, if I go to reload this page, sure enough, we see all those note files that were just created. So pretty cool. It shows you just in a few seconds how you can go from having this Swan microcontroller out of the box, installing CircuitPython, running some Python code, iterating over that code really quickly, creating completely new programs in a matter of seconds, and then even connecting it to a cellular board and pushing that data to the cloud. So I hope that all made sense. If you're looking for some next steps with Swan and CircuitPython, check out our basic install instructions on GitHub at github.com slash blues slash CircuitPython slash releases. We also have a quick start for developing on Arduino IDE at dev.blues.io. And I point that out because we will be adding CircuitPython support to that quick start shortly. And finally, on dev.blues.io, we also have a really cool guide for building and deploying an Edge ML model with Edge Impulse on the Swan that you should also check out. So that's it for me. Back to you, Brandon. All right. Thanks so much, Rob. It's great. So two demos down. We have one fun one ahead. And this is actually, before I hand this back over to Zach, I wanted to come back around to something that I haven't really mentioned yet, but you may have noticed in all of the pictures that we've had uh, about the Swan littered throughout this presentation. And you may have noticed these nice little castellated edges that are around the base of the device. And so the Swan is a Feather compatible MCU. So you can solder in uh, mail header pins and plug it into a breadboard, use it with any Feather wing that you might wish. But we actually provided another feature of the device that brings 55 GPIO pins out to a set of castellated edges around the board. So you can solder that down directly into your own PCB or a carrier that we provide and access so much on the board itself, including eight analog and 16 digital pins, four I squared C and three spy buses, one USB OTG full speed, uh, one 14 channel DMA, a true random number generator, a 12 bit ADC and two 12 bit DACs, a low power RTC and CRC calculation peripherals. There's so much on this board and we wanted to give our customers and give developers the ability to access the power of that core MCU so that nothing went to waste. And so there's a lot on there. And I do want to give Zach an opportunity to share more, not steal his thunder, to give you a demo of using the Swan beyond the feather. So once again, Zach, take it away. Hello once again, and thank you, Brandon. All right, so what does it mean to take the Swan beyond the feather? Well. If you haven't guessed already, it means taking advantage of the castellated edges that we just talked about. And how do you do that? Well, we've provided a Swan carrier board that allows it, where you can see right there, if you look at it, the two lines of solder pads and how close they are together. Well, that allows you to take the Swan and its castellated edge, solder it down, and then get access to the 64 pins on the two rails that run up and down the sides. Okay, so now the first thing I thought of after I saw this beyond cool is, well, what am I gonna use so many pins on? I mean, some of you probably already have an answer right now, but I started thinking like, well, what would you do? Well, for one, 
there are some peripherals that are only available when you have access to the additional pins, namely QSPI. So that's Quad SPI, if you don't know, and it, it operates significantly faster than standard SPI, and it works in a slightly different way. Um, but the other things that you can do is you can get access to multiple I2C and SPI buses. Then again, if you're like me, you're like, why do I need more than one bus? That was the first thought that I had. Uh, one of the things that you kind of, once you start stewing on that, you'll realize one advantage you can get from this is bus isolation. This could come in really handy if you were making a product and you had, if the product itself had peripherals that were maybe sensors or something of that nature, and you wanted them to be on one I2C pool and then you had internal operations that you wanted to be on a completely separate I2C pool. This would make it, you know, maybe some security. If these were completely plug and play, that would prevent someone from plugging in and checking the internals of your product. Uh, there could be several other reasons that I can't think about off the top of my head. But, um, oh, another good one. There was a guy at... A, one of our previous webinars and he had six I2C sensors. Uh, they only have their primary address and one alternate address. So that means that only two of these sensors can be plugged into any single I2C bus. Well, he needed six in his project and coincidentally we have three I2Cs available when you use the expanded rails, which that allowed him to take all six of his sensors and stick them on a single MCU. Uh, and that that's actually really nice because then you can sort of aggregate data or do comparisons or anything that you wish when it's all in one place uh, without having to do extra legwork to get it to aggregate it. Uh, but probably I think the most important thing would be to discuss the myriad of GPIO pins that would allow you to interface with nearly any device. So uh, think of it as a Swiss army knife that allows you to gain access to maybe any old standard piece of equipment you have sitting around or even non-standard piece of equipment you have sitting around that maybe your company uses, uh, has been running. It's one of those ain't broke, don't fix it scenarios within the company. Uh, and so the problem is when you have a device like that, typically you don't have any way to move it forward into the future and it ends up, while it's very important for your company to leave it alone, it also is going to slowly kill you as opposed to changing it and instantly dying. So that's one of the neat things. Let's say that you had a, uh, I don't know, like a battle tested device from like the 90s and it has no real observable protocol that it adheres to but you know that you you need it you want to use it and you don't really have any other way to get at it uh, for me this was my trusty game boy uh, so this is probably i think the biggest benefit of the swan is its ability to interface with almost any uh, existing hardware that's available today so uh, this demo is mostly a talk but then also i'll show you the code run at the end of me hacking the Game Boy by creating a, by using the Swan to emulate a Game Boy game so that I can talk directly to the Game Boy and take control of it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that. At first blush, I have to admit that the Game Boy is surprisingly complex. So it's early 90s tech. I was expecting a very, very slow machine that was very weak and probably had an 8 bit processor especially because it was like the cousin to the Nintendo, you know? Well, it turns out that it's got like a 4.1 megahertz processor. So it's clipping right along and it has 16 bit register. Wait, is it? I think it has a 16 bit. I want to say registers or some sort of, um, Oh, forget about it, but it's, it operates on 16 bits internally, even though it's an eight bit processor, kind of like the Arduino Uno. Uh, but so it, it's like, it's pretty brilliant the way that it works. Uh, but that also means that you have to be a lot faster than maybe you thought you had to be when you have your, um, new 
MCU you're trying to use to interface with it. So uh, there's, this is a super dense graph here. This is just an oscilloscope reading of a snippet in time that is about 50 microseconds long. So there's a lot of activity happening within 50 microseconds. And you can see that that's completely possible because if you look down here at the bottom, this purple line right here, this is the clock. And you can't read the little number there, but that says 480 nanoseconds. So that is every up, down, uh, well, up, down, and back up is uh, just shy of one microsecond but the up and down or half of your oscillation takes 480 nanoseconds so whenever you want to move in and out data it has to be done really quick surprisingly quickly i would have to say so uh i ran into a problem immediately because i was trying to do 16 digital reads to get the address and then do eight digital writes to get the data out. So I have to do all of that very quick to get inside of the clock. Uh, I was actually concerned for a moment because when I first started, I was over time, like I wasn't going to make it. And then I started realizing like one of the greatest things about using STM ST products is that you get access to the ST tool chain. Even if you're using it through the Arduino IDE in VS Code. So I just click the little drop box that I have highlighted there in red and set the optimization from zero for debugging down to uh, optimize level three with link time optimizations enabled. So all of a sudden it went from kind of a dog to screaming fast. Uh, and I don't know if any of you guys have had to do fast IO before like bit banging, but typically you have to do a port read to take the whole thing at once and you can't do individual reads. Uh, and you really have to think about exactly the steps you're taking to optimize things. So like I said before, my non-optimized code was running about 7.8 microseconds for, a, for reading a 16-bit address and then about 3.5 microseconds for the 8-bit data write, which makes sense because, you know, 16 is 2 times 8, 3 is 2 times 7. I'm uh, sorry, I don't know how I just said that, but I mean to say the, the read is twice as big as the write, so it, the write should take half the time roughly, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, but the idea that all of it was happening in about 11 point, what is that? Three, two millisecond microseconds. It was way over my budget of, I think one to two microseconds that I was given. And I was starting to think of, about like, oh geez, I'm going to have to figure out how to do port writes in the ST, like in the ST cube IDE. To, to speed it up. But then I saw that, like I said, that little optimization box, I clicked that and all of a sudden I could read a 16 by address in 200 nanoseconds. And I could write the eight bit data in a hundred nanoseconds, roughly. And holy cow, like everything worked. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to do this, but I'll show you the code. It's gross. Like it is, not my professional whatever whatever coding etc cetera, etc cetera. you know you know the whole story that you read on everybody's posted code i'm going to show it to you it is cringeworthy but this thing could optimize it which is like part of the amazing stuff about having st embedded in the device but all right so you know so what do we have to do to make it well you just you know wire up a couple wires here and there and all of a sudden boom you've got access I mean, it's actually kind of like that easy, except for there are 32 pins on a Game Boy cartridge, and it's a lot of really teeny tiny soldering that you have to do, and you have to kind of destroy Tetris, whatever you do. Uh, <laughs> it Rest in peace. Uh, I had to sacrifice a Tetris cartridge to get this thing to work, um, and it requires some Dremel action and some other things. But I was able to get my uh, little rainbow jumper wires down in there, soldered down to the, the, well, the cart pin, 
the pin out from the cartridge. And then I can slip all of that into the Game Boy just the way you would load a standard Game Boy cartridge, which then gives me the ability to talk back and forth with it directly from this one. And again, this is something that would not be possible uh, without additional uh, integrated circuits uh, if it weren't for this one. And like in all fairness, looking up here, you can see in that breadboard some blue ICs sitting there, but those are just logic level shifters. And I bought them and placed them in the breadboard before I realized that the ST chip that we're using is five volt tolerant. So odds are I probably didn't need them at all. And in fact, I couldn't even use one of them. Uh, I had to just, rem I had to just not, I had to disable it and then put the wires on the other side to get the whole thing to work anyway. So it definitely was leveraging some of the five volt tolerant pins. And uh, my guess would be that this could have all been done if you choose carefully, because not all pins are five volt tolerant. But my guess is that you could do this directly by just pl like plugging it from the cart into the swan, nothing else in the middle, no man in the middle. Uh, so like I said, a little bit of wires, a little bit of solder, and I got in there. So with no further ado, let's flip over to my bench and I will show you it in action. All right, here we are. So Game Boy, voila. And I've got the Swan sitting here, soldered into the expansion board. You can see how that works. And then obviously I have a litter of wires back there. But, uh, and in this, there is no external power. The Game Boy will power up the Swan. The Swan will boot in time and be able to respond to the Game Boy and without missing a beat. So we'll flip this over here. There we go. And there you have it. So instead of our typical Nintendo, we see the swan. And then I could even take this a step further. Let's see if I can get over there. Um, oh yeah, let's go back to my desktop. Here we go. So I'm in the code. Uh, here's the swan logo and the Nintendo logo. So just to show you that this isn't fake, I've, I've left that on and then I would just tell it, oh yeah, let's, let's look at the gross code. Like I said, this is as embarrassing as showing you my underwear. Uh, this is so horrible, but <laughs> I was up to like four writing this stuff. Uh, all right. So it's just like, you'll look at it and you'll note that nothing is well written here. I think that's probably the thing I really want you to take away from this that I'm, I'm performing digital writes on each and every pin and doing digital read on each and every pin and uh, instead of using ports and the optimization just smooths all that over as if I was a good code writer for this thing. So, okay, well, enough of that. And let's see, we'll change it from the Swan logo to the Nintendo logo. And then let me jump back and then I just click this little button here to upload the new code. It's going to start and then I'm going to flip you back over to the desktop. And a neat thing I notice is that it actually reboots it when it has a successful deployment of code. So hopefully we'll hear the chime here in a second and then it'll reboot with the, there you go, Nintendo logo. So now it's restored back to its former glory uh, and it's that easy to do. So, like I said, guys, the Swan's amazing. Not only is it five volt tolerant, it's got tons of GPIOs for kind of any problem that you could even start to wrap your head around. It's fast enough that it can jump in on the existing timing. And this is display timing. This is not just some protocol bus. Like I don't have the ability to queue everything up. I have to get it and write it kind of instantaneously. And the swan does this with ease and you saw the code it's garbage like so it, it was able to transform garbage code with an awesome compiler into great a great binary i should say and then it runs it like plenty enough speed and clearly if i had written good code and then optimized it it would be that much better all right thanks so much zach now we're about to transition into live q a but as we do so i did want to mention that if you're interested in grabbing the Swan, checking it out, 
even potentially learning a little bit more about the note card, we have a discount code SWAN-Webinar that you can use. It'll come out in the emails as well uh, that, that Hackster will follow up with, but you can use that code and save 20% on either the SWAN by itself or the, uh, the, the Feather Starter Kit for SWAN that includes the note card uh, so that you can explore cellular IoT as well. You can grab either of those at shop.blues.io. And again, swan-webinar is the code to use. We'll add it here in chat really quick and uh, feel free to use that. So we're going to transition now into live Q&A and just bear with me for just a moment uh, as we uh, as we swap over, turn all of our video feeds back on, and we'll, uh, we'll take questions as they come up in the Q&A panel. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Brandon, Zach, and Rob, for those demos. That was awesome. Um, so we do have quite a few questions that came in, and so I'm going to let you guys take that over. We are at our hour mark, so if you do have to leave, um, post your questions really quick, and they'll try to get to them before the end. We'll give about 10 more minutes here um, just so you, we can do some, some questions live. And uh, if you guys don't get your questions answered, I will also post the link to the forums at Blues Wireless uh, in the chat in a second here, so you can also go over there and ask your questions there. Uh, so thanks, guys. I'll let you take it over from here. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, and great, great, great questions. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us through the hour. We'll take about another 10 minutes to answer questions and anything else that comes across uh, in chat in the next little bit. There's definitely, I think uh, everybody really appreciated the demos, Zach and Rob, lots of uh, lots of love for the Nintendo hack. Uh, I saw a mention of the, you got the gratuitous Salier logic analyzer, and that was, that was noted in the chat as well. Uh, but let's actually go through a couple of these questions. We've answered a ton over the course of the last hour, but one that uh, I saw early on that I wanted to throw to Rob was questions about what uh, the note card, what cellular uh, bands and radio access technologies are supported in the current products? Yeah, so there's actually four different note card models you should be aware of. Um, they're all documented in uh, on our developer site, developer portal at dev.blues.io, but basically it's going to depend on where you're going to deploy it around the world. So we do have a global narrowband note card. Um, we have a uh, a narrow band note card just for North America. And we have a wide band for uh, EMEA and a fourth one that I'm blanking on, of course. But um, with those four note cards, we offer support for LTEM, NBIO, NBIOT, and CAT1. And if you want to dig down into the specific frequency bands, I recommend consulting our data sheet and looking at the actual Quectel modem that we're using with each note card and you can like dive into their data sheets and see like, you know, with you can get specific information for your country and exactly which frequency bands are gonna be supported there. Yeah, definitely. Thanks Rob. So yeah, head over to dev.blues.io, check out the hardware section. We have the data sheets for all the four variants you'll see listed there, as well as which of those variants support uh, which countries. And we have support for over 135 countries if you're looking for the broadest amount of support, the NBGL, our narrowband global note card supports about 135 countries on both NBIOT and CATM. So, and that's uh, the one we ship by default, just so everybody knows. Yeah, like yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the one we ship by default. So let's talk about uh, remote low power battery powered nodes. I'm gonna throw this one to you, Zach, because I know you've messed with a lot of battery powered applications, uh, both on the SWAN and on the note card itself. So there's a few questions about what's the potential for remote uh, battery powered node. And then if you could talk to about just low power operations sort of how we do it on the note card and then what options we provide in the SWAN as well. Yeah, so uh, can you guys hear me? Cause my, audio, my stuff- Yeah, you're crazy. good. Okay, great. You're good. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I ran into, uh, or well, yes, it, it's really good. It's designed around low power. I should start with that. Like that was the whole purpose. Uh, and this, the note card itself idles at eight microamps, like really low. Yeah, uh, so, or well, approximately eight microamps. And so uh, you can use the way that it works. And I've used it in a bunch of remote situations. Like I made a stream monitoring project. You can find that here on Hackster actually, but I floated this thing in a stream and it ran on a solar panel. So it can go for a long time, like indefinitely running on only solar power. And the MCU that I had selected is not necessarily known as a, um, oh, it's a power intensive, like an MC, it was an ESP32, I'll just say that, which they use a lot of power, uh, or they can, 
And uh, so it's not known for its low, low power profile or anything like that. But what's cool is you tell the note card and the note card has a locking or latching uh, interrupt. And so you'll have the MCU say, hey, I, I need to go to sleep now. Uh, I've done all the computation I need to do. I need to go to sleep. And it tells the note card, the note card says, all right, good night. And then it latches that interrupt and then it goes down. And so then all of a sudden on a timer or on motion or um, on a note or like an inbound note, uh, any of those things, and there's a couple others I can't think of off the top of my head, will light up, will trigger that interrupt, which you tether directly to the enable pin of the MCU, and then it'll pop back up and it'll work. So you'll have, you want to, execute whatever kind of code you need to do to do the computation you need as quickly as possible, obviously, but it can even run at high power on battery because it's going to be a, a burst, if you will, or a, like a short power draw. And then it will request to go back to sleep and then it will sit and idle. I mean, cause it's off because you're going to disable it, but then the whole thing will idle at the note cards idle, which is eight microamps. So most batteries decay faster than that anyway. So this is a super low, like low power mode. And it's very, very easy. It's a JSON command away to enter. It's not like you have to stop a whole bunch of processors, uh, flip a bunch of peripherals off and on, like all, forget that. Like just leave your MCU in a high power state uh, and ask for it to go to bed. It'll get shut down and then it'll reboot sample everything it needs to sample, send that off on the note card or cue it to the note card. It doesn't have to send it away. You just cue it over the note card, go to sleep. Okay, done. And then this idles and you'll tell the note card itself a schedule of when it should connect to the cell tower so that you can really optimize around battery. I mean, that is one of the founding principles of the note card. All right, thanks, Eric. Yeah, and while we're, while we're talking about that, I'll, I'll mention for those of you that are interested in the low power support, we have the same MCU on both the SWAN and the note card. So the things that we do on the note card to operate in stop two and low power mode, you can do on the SWAN as well. And the STM32 HAL documentation has a ton of great examples for that. We'll be shipping examples for it soon as well, if those are interested. Related to that STM32 L4, there was a question from Kangman about those chips are out of stock everywhere. How can you ensure production? We have a lot. I'll just tell you that if you have, if you're curious and you want to do a volume purchase, shoot me an email at brandon at blues.com. Um, I can tell you that we've been aggressively pre-ordering pre -ordering, uh, parts since early 2020. So we're more than willing to entertain conversations around what, what folks are wanting to do at scale with the note card and even potentially with the SWAN. Uh, there are a few questions about uh, the purpose of the SIM socket on the carrier, on the note carriers. That's a great question from, uh, from Sue here. We are actually, we do support external SIMs on those note carriers. So if you're operating in a country where we don't have uh, support for the note card uh, with our built-in eSIM. You can use a Twilio SIM or a SIM from Geo or from Airtel or for, uh, from another, another provider like that, or just depending on your needs. And so you do have that flexibility. Um, we also, let's see, there's another question I was going to throw. I was going to throw, oh, there's a question from Dario about what happens when the date on the note card uh, is over, how do we renew the amount? And if you check out blues.io slash services, that actually has a list of our, our pricing plans on the cloud service and data side. So we do provide something called connectivity assurance where you can actually get top up pricing on the note card if you go over 500 megs and uh, uh, in the 10 year period. So um, let me see. Oh, here's a question. Let's see. Uh, I'll throw this one back to you, Zach from Naveen. Does Swan support I2S? Uh, yes, it does. So it actually has a ton of all sorts of peripherals that it does uh, support, but I2S is one of them. It has, was it two DACs and I2S lines. So it's it's pretty awesome. And so it, it, the list goes on and on. If you'll go over to our product page or the if you go to the dev.blues.io and look up its data sheet, then you can look on there. And I think that uh, there's at least a link to the proper uh, STM chip that's on there. So you can see the full supported uh, peripherals. But yes, absolutely, I2S. Cool. And Rob, what about MicroPython support? Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, <laughs> yes, maybe. Uh, I think there's some definitely at least three questions I saw pop through about low power support with CircuitPython. Um, I'm not the CircuitPython expert, even though I pretended to be today. 
uh, but we are looking into MicroPython support. Uh, this is my understanding that we could better support the low power modes on the ST chip with that. So to be yeah, determined. those of you that have have played with both might be aware. MicroPython does have a few features that we are definitely envious of, like interrupts. Interrupts are not available in CircuitPython. That's one that we'd love to be able to support on the Swan. The drawback is that MicroPython doesn't have the same level of library support for external sensors and things like that. So there is some emerging work happening where it's quite easy to port CircuitPython libraries over to MicroPython and what have you. But um, we did see that there is some existing STM32 L4 family support in MicroPython. So we're going to look into to adding that in there as well. Uh, and uh, I saw the last question we'll take. So here it asks, is there a doc on how to debug using VS Code? Zach, you want to answer that one? Uh, yes, there is. I, not only is this recorded and I just did it live, but also on our doc site, on, uh, if you go to dev.blues.io, again, we have a tutorial for setting up the SWAN. It's, I think it's called it's like getting started with the SWAN or start SWAN. I've kind of lost track of the navigation, but you get in there hop in, take a look, and uh, we will walk you through step by step, give you every URL to copy, and you will be ready to go. Great. One um, last question I did want to answer here, if I could quickly. Somebody asked about those cellular protocols and which ones are supported uh, when and if there's any settings you need to apply. One thing that I think is really cool about the note card is that it's going to programmatically work through those protocols in a certain order. Um, but if you want to, like you probably don't want to prioritize NB-IoT because it can take forever to uh, to grab a, a appropriate uh, signal with NB-IoT. Um, so what was I going to say? Oh, there's a there's an API call you can make to actually uh, put the no card into a specific mode to actually look for a specific protocol as well. So it's it's automated in one way and it's also very flexible in terms of if you want to customize it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us and for you guys coming on and showing us all these demos and giving these pre this presentation. It has been really fun um, and we appreciate it. Absolutely. So, Thanks, everybody. You, you can reach any of us at firstname at blues.com. Feel free to email us directly. We're happy to answer any other questions we didn't get to today. But thank you so much, Katie, for hosting us. Perfect. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we'll also be sending out that follow up email with the link to the recording and uh, some more information that that these guys gave today. So thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.